Let me open this up. Hello, ladies right. and gentlemen. This is Gatewood Galbraith. I'm here in this wonderful city of Portland, Oregon, at the bequest of my longtime friend and 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 marijuana activist and all-around good guy, Mr. Paul Stanford, uh, sitting here on my right, and uh, the uh, movement's uh, uh, dream voice on uh, on radio and on the internet, uh, Mr. Casper Leach, host of Time for Hemp. Uh, timeforhemp.com, check it out. Uh, we're here today at a, a fundraiser for me. That's here for a fundraiser for Gatewood Calvary. That's right. Governor. Uh, there you go, there you go, there you go. The Bluegrass State. Let me explain it to you. Uh, I am from Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. I'm an independent candidate for governor this November in the governor's race in Kentucky. Uh, today is May the uh, 15th, I believe. And uh, so what we have about to six months to go. Uh, they brought me out to be on uh, Paul's TV program, which I was very honored to be asked. And uh, they have set this up fundraiser for me in this wonderful theater called the Clinton Theater. And all the audience is small. Uh, the I can feel the I can feel that the dedication to seeing uh, laws change uh, on a variety of subjects, which includes. Uh, marijuana in the case of uh, this group here that I'm associated with today. Uh, <clears throat> Kentucky was the world's largest producer of hemp for over 100 years. It was our largest cash crop for, for more than a century. And uh, imagine that, a, a state whose largest cash crop was hemp. And uh, I'm sure that the, the smoking aspect of it was, uh, you know, was also well represented. Um, people uh, of course, in the early 1900s, it uh, went down and they illegalized it in 37. Uh, Kentucky should be the place where cannabis is returned as a cash crop in the state of Kentucky. And I started out a long time ago to try to make that a reality. Uh, I'm a fourth generation Kentuckian. Uh, I was 24 years old in the milk land in 1971 when I decided I was grist for the mill. Uh, that I was going to end up in prison or in, in jail or dead at an early age. So I decided that uh, I'd better learn the system. So, uh, or I was just going to be a victim of it. So I decided I was going to go to college to become an attorney. <coughs> and while I was at it, if I was going to put that much into it, I might as well become governor and change the marijuana laws in the state of Kentucky and quit treating our people like we're in occupied territory <coughs> and take the government out of the, uh, the helicopters uh, out of the air that are hovering over the fields and gardens of the people of the state of Kentucky and put marijuana into the hands of as many sick and dying people in the state as I possibly could. And that's what I started out to do 40 years ago and I've gotten up every day since that time to do that. I've run for office in the state of Kentucky on several occasions. This is my fifth time for governor. I've also run for uh, a, a agricultural commissioner, attorney general, and congress twice. I've posed some mighty impressive numbers. I won't bore you with them all, but let me tell you that this time we is the very best chance that I've ever had to actually win the governor of the state of Kentucky. Let me tell you what that would do to the political landscape in the United States of America. That would be phenomenal. There was an independent uh, elected for the first time in 150 years in Rhode Island last, last uh, political season. But he had been a state, a U.S. state senator out of that, uh, out of that state, so he already had a statewide basis to go independent with. My running mate and I are totally independent, no party affiliation whatsoever. I've got a lady running mate named Dee Riley, who's phenomenal. Uh, the mother of six, two adopted, one of her natural children has special needs. She knows where the, 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 the politics hit the road about policies for women and children in the state. And uh, she's smart as a tack, and we need more women in leadership roles in the state of Kentucky. Uh, I am running this time. This is what I say. They say, Galbraith, you're a uh, perennial candidate. And I said, well, Kentucky's got perennial problems. If the people in Kentucky had, 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 who had beaten me had actually fixed the problems, I wouldn't have had to run again. But they didn't, and they have it, and they can't, because neither party could produce a candidate can disengage from the partisanship long enough to work the other side to get the job done. And the leadership of the parties in, in uh, both the major parties in the state of Kentucky had their horns locked up like two bull elk fighting over territory while the business of the people lays dead in the dust. 
So I'm running right now, I say that only an independent who doesn't care who gets credit for doing what's right for the people of the state of Kentucky stand the best chance of untying that Gordian knot and letting both parties operate in a fashion that a lot of the well-intentioned membership really want to, want to work. The beauty of it is we're not looking to replace either party. We're not looking to throw the rascals out. We're not looking for you to vote against your, uh, you know, your representative or senator. And uh, we don't want you to renounce your family's party. We're not asking you to do that. We're not asking you to vote for the dreaded other party. We're asking you to vote for an independent who wants to work with you to try to get the job done. And so uh, I've offered myself again this time, and the difference is there are several things. Uh, first of all is that everybody's sick and tired of the gridlock in Kentucky. As they say, I could accuse Kentucky of being the victim of electile dysfunction. They, uh, they just can't seem to get it right. And uh, so uh, what we think is that uh, we know for a fact uh, that we're already climbing in the polls. I, t I said uh, last time uh, they, they polled us about, about six months ago at 5%, and they said, what did you think? And I said, that's great with me. I, I believe we'll be 10% by May and uh, 15 to 20% by September. We were at 13% in April. So, uh, you know, we're, we're moving on up. We're never really not spending any money. We don't have it to spend. Uh, but I've never spent more than $20,000 on any campaign in the past. We've spent 140000 on this so far. Uh, you know, uh, ninety thousand of it is my money. Uh, I, I practice law for a living. I live, I live fee to fee. Uh, but I smell it this time. I smell it this time. That people are sick and tired of it. I got uh, endorsed by a union the other day, and I said, "Why, uh, you know, well, why did you folks endorse me?" And they said, "Because you've never lied to us, Gatewood." And I said, "Well, hell, if I was going to lie to you, I'd already been elected." You know. And, uh, and pe people are understanding that, and uh, people are cluing into that. So uh, what does an election for Gatewood Galbraith in Kentucky mean for the people of the city of Portland and the city people of Oregon? I'll tell you what it means. For the first time in my memory that I've ever heard, the people of America are going to have a champion who believes it when the Founding Fathers conferred sovereignty on us as human beings, when they said that every Every human being is endowed by their creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, certain inalienable rights. <clears throat> and uh, for the first time, think about that. Before the American Revolution came about, we were all property. We belonged to the local king or queen, to the local warlord, or whoever possessed the most gunpowder in the valley. You didn't have any inalienable rights. People didn't have any inalienable rights. If the ruler said, hey, come in here, off with their head, there you went. There was nobody to intercede on your behalf. But the founding fathers took humankind out of the category of property and conferred on them the concept of sovereign human beings, self-determinative, individualized, worth something individually, and something that the government couldn't take away or mess with. And they wrote a constitution. The Declaration of Independence didn't become law, but the constitution they fashioned to try to immortalize that was, was their attempt to write a set of laws that was going to keep that project in mind. So it was a human revolution, that conference of sovereignty on the individual. And then they turned us loose. And with that kind of freedom, we've become in America, and that's the way it was supposed to have started out and what we've been trying to keep up. But that concept of individual sovereignty is under great pressure today. And the current generation is facing the greatest threat of all of having the Bill of Rights just flat drawn out from underneath us. In the, uh, in the nanny state thought line of protecting us from ourselves. But what it is, is uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, absolute assault on the uh, on the uh, privileges of a sovereign human beings and sovereign citizens of the Constitution. So the, uh, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is not a law because it is not in the Constitution. But in the state of Kentucky, the very first section of the Constitution of the state of Kentucky says that we're all 
uh, possessed of inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So I'm going to reconstruct Kentucky's policy and Kentucky's government around that thesis. And we're going to rediscover whether America still has a pulse. We're going to try to become the template of what freedom of the individual means in the state of Kentucky. I believe we'll become a tourist mecca. I believe that uh, people will come in from all around the, uh, the, uh, the country and the globe to see what it likes to live free. And I'm not talking about riots in the streets. I'm not talking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, people uh, causing uh, tumult uh, out in public. I don't see that happening. I just think that the idea that uh, we're attempting it is going to bring in the, the right-minded people. But uh, we're going to try to spread it out. We're going to try to rediscover the American Revolution. And we're going to do that by uh, putting the processes and the surpluses of a form of government out to the people instead of special interests. I know who those special interests are, and I'm going to put a stop to it, and the savings we're going to put back into the hands of the people. So uh, I, uh, I I can tell you a couple of plans that I, I have for the state of Kentucky. Uh, I'd appreciate if I get that opportunity. I'm yep. sitting up here with a couple of uh, a couple of movers and shakers in the, the uh, in the, the prospect of uh, medical marijuana and marijuana with people. I said early on that I wanted to uh, make marijuana legal, but I, I don't want to make marijuana legal because eight-year-olds can stand on the street corner and eat a tomato, and that's legal. I don't want that. I want some sort of uh, People ought to be able to grow their own uh, and be regulated by families. If there's any problem with it, bring in social services instead of the cops. Uh, you know, if uh, and only that under probable cause. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> if it's going to be commerce in it, the government has the right to license and or tax. They just have that right. I mean, that's commerce. Uh, they do the same thing with widgets. So, uh, you know, but I want that money. I don't want it going over to the corporations. I don't want Friday night sales. I don't want golden arches. I don't want clearance sales. I don't want any advertising encouraging its use. That's not what we're out here for. You know, at the same time, I'd like to see the money that's generated back go back to the dealers, the people who are dealing now. They're some of the best minds of this generation. They're running a billion dollar <laughs> business without a shred of paperwork. You know, I think they ought to, I think it ought to stay in the hands of the people who are putting it out now. But, uh, I'm also going to uh, put it in the hands of all the sick and dying Kentuckians. I want to uh, take it out of the hands of the teenagers and put it over to the hands of the people in the old age homes. I mean, it would put a smile on their face, it would increase their appetite, and think about the increased visitation by the young folks. Hey, let's go see Dad. You know, the, uh, uh, want to, uh, I want to educate the people, the kids in the state of Kentucky, and I have plans for doing that. Um, I'm out here uh, to see if I can raise any money. It, uh, I am a criminal defense attorney. I can also for hire uh, any lottery winners out there who need a little consultation. Um, there is no limit. There is a limit on a thousand dollar contribution in my race for governor, but there is no limit on a gov on, a, on an attorney's <laughs> fee. So um, anybody who needs any special consultation, I'm the man to do it with. Um, money is probably going to be the biggest issue in this race. We, we probably need to raise about a half million bucks. We're at 140,000 right now. As our numbers begin to climb, I think the money will start to come in. But uh, this early money is the most important. So um, I've got envelopes down here um, that if you want to make a contribution, you can take this envelope and fill it out and either mail it to us or give it back to me here tonight. They're in a the box over there. I have uh, our handouts. This is our push package. Uh, this is uh, me and my running mate uh, who is, uh, who, <laughs> I had some people complain that, about a woman as a running mate and I said, you're just jealous because she can outride, outshoot, and outfish every one of you. And, uh, and she can. So, uh, you know, she's quite a lady. And uh, then I have this with me this evening. This is my autobiography. It's called The Last Free Man in America Meets the Synthetic Subversion. It is the story of uh, 40 years of work on my behalf 
to try to find out just what went wrong with America. Wow. What, what went wrong with, uh, with the concept of individual sovereignty. And the name of the book is The Last Free Man in America Meets the Synthetic Subversion. And that's what went wrong. That, uh, that we were an agrarian society, we produced it all from the land, we discovered the plant that was the answer to all our most basic needs, probably with fuel, medicine, and food. And then they discovered petroleum, and they discovered all the synthetic processes that could be done to extract products from petroleum. And they decided to take the farmer out of competition with them, not only in the petrochemical, but the pharmaceutical and medicinal aspect. <clears throat> And so now a great number of our problems are uh, dealt with because both the major parties that were set up to protect us, uh, both on a national and local level, had been bought off with the special interest money, extraordinary special interest money from the people that I call the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, fascist, elite, son of a bitches. Kind of the one, to it, the right? ones who have yeah. never said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America or to the Republic for which it stands, and the ones who view the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as impediments to the implementation of a new world order and global economy. And that, that's just where it's at. These people have bought off the people who are supposed to be protecting us. They're trying to dismantle the Constitution and our rights just as fast as they can. Well, they ran into a hard road hole in the state of Kentucky if I get to be governor. That I recognize them for who they are, them guys. And I ain't gonna let them guys take over and make a mockery out of the sacrifices of all the dads and granddads who hit the beaches at Normandy and Iwo Jima so that you wouldn't have to be in a cup to hold a job in America. So we're gonna rediscover uh, whether the people, in fact, those people died uh, in vain Every generation must rewin its own freedoms. That's what it says here in this little cloud on the front of the book. You know, all the sacrifices that anybody in the past up until the last second of my talking to you don't count anymore. It's what you're willing to do from this second forward that's going to decide whether we still have any freedoms to America. The reason I became a champion of marijuana is because I was asthmatic all my life. And, uh, I uh, was uh, in and out of the hospital on many occasions. I was 4F for the Army. I made the Marines take me by getting a couple of doctors to say I had outgrown it. I was on Paris Island for six weeks, and somebody pitched some dust in my face, and I went into an asthmatic attack. I was discharged from Paris Island, the Marines. I was 19 years old. I didn't know marijuana cured asthma. A friend of mine came back from Bangkok, Thailand with some Thai weed and said, Gatewood, try this. And I said, isn't that dangerous? And he says, it'll help you. He had to become a doctor, so I trusted him. I smoked marijuana the first time, just like that, it cured my asthma. Just like that. For someone who's gone through a lifetime of 21 years, being totally afraid that at any moment their lungs are gonna close up on them, let me tell you, that creates a lot of free-floating anxiety. And, uh, you know, a lot of fear Marijuana cured it, just like that. Because I tell you what, marijuana is a gateway drug. Marijuana is the gateway to existentialism. When you discover that there's more than one reality, when you discover that it is no just one way of looking at things, there are things called perspectives and you discover that you have the widest range of choices you ever imagined you had because you now understand there's a second way of looking at everything. You just doubled or tripled or quadrupled the way you can look at things. It's damned entertaining trying to figure out which one has anything to do with reality. That's what makes it such a, a wonderful thing. It just alters your perspective. So does getting up and uh, going looking out the window, getting off the couch. So does thinking. <coughs> but when I discovered it cured my asthma, what could I do? I couldn't shut up about it. So I became its champion and I still am. And I can't tell you just how, how exhilarated I am having come out here to Portland and see the kinds of, uh, see the kinds of, uh, 
uh, advances that you all have made. I mean, and to be associated with a person who's helped make those advances, Mr. Paul Stanford is just a real thrill. And uh, I would, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm out here to learn from him because uh, he's been very successful in helping that, and I'm sure all of you all who have helped him uh, deserve a great deal of that credit too. And Mr. Casper Leach, who's known worldwide for time for him, uh, who's had Paul and me and Willie and uh, all kinds of other folks on uh, time for him for what, 20 years now, right? Yeah, I've been at it, I've been at it for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to come out here and be associated with these people is, is wonderful. Uh, but I am uh, uh, looking into the camera, and I know that it's going to, this is going to be played in places other than this theater. So uh, let me tell you the story. I was running for governor in 1990. I had $700 on me. My wife was divorcing me. I was uh, pretty well bankrupt, but I wasn't going to give up on the governor's end of it. So I went out, and I rented a TV camera and a, and a chair, and I sat in that camera and looked into the camera and uh, gave who I was and what I was doing. Then I paid him another $400 to send it up on satellite. No particular time, nothing. Two days later, I'm coming back to my law office, and there's a note on the door that says, uh, Gatewood, call your ex-wife. Willie Nelson is trying to get a hold of you. And so uh, I called my ex-wife because my phones had been cut off. And uh, so uh, she said, yeah, Willie was driving down the road on his bus surfing the channels, and he caught the whole 30 minutes of you looking into the camera and talking about what you were doing. And he says he wants to help. And so, uh, yeah, Willie, I called Willie and we got together. And there's a whole story about how, how that happened, but that's a pretty good start. But uh, the fact is that you can never tell how far your voice is going to carry and who's going to be watching this. So I'm telling you that if you want to advance freedom and individual freedom and attempt to find out whether America still has a voice, uh, the Gatewood Galbraith D. Riley campaign for governor of the state of Kentucky is the one to get into. And uh, we figure we need about a half million. We've raised about 150,000 thus far. Uh, we can always use, a, always use a big dog. It's time some big dogs got involved in this. We're willing to advance the idea of America more than anybody else is in this country. And uh, I'm just the guy to do it. You know, I, was, I was voted the honoriest kid to ever come out of Nicholas County. I'm, ju I'm just the guy to do it. But I really appreciate it. I've been just uh, uh, just ecstatic about my treatment out here and uh, meeting all you fine folks. If you can uh, make a contribution tonight, I have a book for you. Um, and uh, if you can't, I probably still have a book for you. I'm that kind of guy. Thanks very much.